title of my message this morning is America, a Moment of Destiny. Over the last few weeks and months, I have become convinced that not only we as a nation, but we as individuals are standing at the crossroads of eternity and that this is a moment of destiny. The choices we make settle our destiny and the book of Revelation speaks of hope and courage in this generation. So let's pray as we open the word of God together. Father in heaven, as we open your word, come by your spirit and speak to us. May this be a special meeting where we sense the Holy Spirit talking not only to our nation, but talking to us personally. Teach us the importance of making good choices every single day. Help us to know that every seed will go to harvest, a harvest of righteousness or a harvest of unrighteousness, a harvest of holiness or a un harvest of unholiness. Come speak to us through your book, we pray thee in Christ's name. Amen. America is at the crossroads. We're really at a moment of destiny. Moral values are waning. Honesty, integrity, purity are in short supply. One writer put it this way. Christian morality is being ushered out of the American social structures and off the cultural main stage, leaving a vacuum in its place. And the broader culture is attempting to fill that void. So you get what the writer is saying. He's saying essentially that the culture is influencing the church in individuals rather than the church changing the culture. Then he makes this remarkable statement. New research reveals a growing concern about the moral condition of the nation, even as many American adults admit that they're uncertain about how to determine right from wrong. That is a shocking statement, that many American adults today are uncertain how to determine right from wrong. They're asking this question, is right a matter of what I feel? Is right a matter of how I think? Is my feeling about what's right as good as your feeling about what is right? Are there any moral absolutes in our society today? Now, according to a recent poll by Barna Research Group, 80% of Americans, regardless of ethnicity, regardless of gender, regardless of social economic status and political ideology, express concern about the nation's moral condition. 80% of Americans, eight out of 10, say we are deeply concerned about the moral condition of America. It's very interesting. In 1960, 72% of the American population said this, we believe that our government will do the right thing always or almost all the time, 72%. When the poll was taken just a few weeks ago, it said this, that statistic has dramatically plummeted to 19%. 19% of Americans said, we believe that the government will do the right thing always or almost all the time. That's 81% said that we have serious questions about that. Now, I want you to compare those two statistics. 80% of Americans say, we are deeply concerned about the culture, and we're not sure what's right, and we're not sure what's wrong. We're kind of like a drift on a moral sea. 81% said that we've lost confidence in the ability of leaders to make moral decisions. May I suggest to you this morning that a nation is in serious trouble when popularity is more important than purity, when the almighty dollar is more important than the, than the almighty's decency 
a nation is in trouble. When entertainment is more important than ethics, a nation is in trouble. When pleasure parties are dominated by alcohol and mind-numbing music and open immorality, a nation is in trouble. When there's confusion of sexual roles and sexual orientation, and when God's original plan of one man married to one woman for a lifetime is flagrantly violated, a nation is in trouble. When crime is rampant in our streets and Christ is mocked in our schools, a nation is in trouble. When some legislators seek laws to allow people of various sexual orientations to use the same school bathrooms, but students are forbidden to pray in the name of Jesus, a nation is in trouble. And when you protect the eggs of the endangered species of turtles in Florida, and when you can go to jail for destroying the eggs of turtles, and you can go to jail for destroying the eggs of the bald eagle, but open abortion is practiced in a nation, I would like to suggest to you a nation is in trouble. Do you know that in New York State, one out of three pregnancies end with an abortion. That's in the United States of America today. The New York legislator this week passed a law that it is no longer illegal to abort a baby full term. No longer illegal. Ladies and gentlemen, the moral fabric of our society is falling apart. Take your Bible, please, and turn to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs, the 14th chapter, and the 34th verse. The scriptures speak to this generation, and they speak not only to government leaders, they speak not only to public officials, they speak not only to society, but they speak to you and they speak to me. The book of Revelation talks about two harvests, the harvest of golden grain, saved men and women saved in God's kingdom, and the harvest of gory grapes, men and women lost. And we're going to study this morning those two harvests, but as a setting, I want you to look at Proverbs chapter 14, verse 34. Notice what it says. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach. That means it destroys a people. Righteousness exalts a nation. Nations are great because nations are good. And when a nation ceases to be good, it ceases to be great. Honesty, integrity, truthfulness, purity, family values are the bedrock foundations of all society. And when these values are compromised, either personally or corporately, nations crumble. Now Solomon puts it this way in Proverbs 26, verse 2. Proverbs 26 and verse 2. Proverbs puts it this way. I'll read it from the New King James, and then we'll look at it in the King James Version. Proverbs 26, verse 2. Like a flitting sparrow, like a flying swallow, so a curse without cause shall not alight. The King James Version puts it a little clearer. It says, the curse shall not causeless come. In other words, there is a law of cause and effect. When a nation, when a society, when individuals compromise the eternal principles of God's values, that society begins to decay from within. That society begins to rot from within. And when it does that, the curse does not causeless come. Now, I was fascinated by taking a look again at that seminal work, that, that documentary work done by Edward Gibbon. In seven, he finished his work in 1787. He spent 20 years researching the Roman Empire. How could an empire that began in 168 B.C. 
and ruled for over 500 years to about 351, how could that empire that was so mighty ever fall and collapse? He lists five major reasons for the fall of the Roman Empire after spending 20 years. See if when I read these reasons that any of them are present in America today. Number one, Gibbon says Rome fell because the rapid increase of divorce. It fell because the undermining of, there was the undermining of the dignity and sanctity of the home, which is the basis of the society. Morality rapidly declined. Immorality was present. The family unit fell apart, and, and uh, sexual promiscuity was commonplace. Number two, the Romans had a very high national debt. And to deal with that debt, what uh, Gibbon said after 20 years of study is they had to impose higher and higher taxes. And in those taxes, the richer got rich and the poor became poorer. Uh, the society became a welfare state and people despised work and they substituted entertainment. Number three, he says there was a mad craze for pleasure in Rome. Sports became the most exciting, but they became more brutal every single year. Think video games, TV, movies, DVDs. Four, he says that the Roman Empire built gigantic armaments and they failed to understand that the real enemy was within and they overextended their military. Five, he said there was a decay of religion, that faith faded into a mere form, losing touch with life and became impotent to warn and guide people. In other words, in the ancient Roman Empire, there was no prophetic voice. There was no solid voice calling men and women in society back to the bedrock values of Scripture. Now, the Bible's last book, the book Revelation, reveals that what is true of nations and societies is also true of individuals. James Russell Lowell, that great American writer, wrote this. He wrote that song, or the poem that was put to a song, Once to Every Man and Nation. He said, Once to Every Man and Nation comes the moment to decide in the strife of truth and falsehood for the good or evil side. We are at a crossroads. Not only is our nation at a crossroads, not only is our society at a crossroads, your family is at a crossroads. You as a husband are at a crossroads. You, as a wife, are at a crossroads. As teenagers, you're at a crossroads. As children, you're at a crossroads. We're at the crossroads of decision. We're at the crossroads of choice. Which way will we go in our lives in the choices that we make? Now, the book of Revelation is the very heart of God's last day message. And it leads us to make positive choices. Take your Bible and turn to Revelation, the 14th chapter. Now, Revelation chapter 14 is divided into three parts. And this is a the first of a series of messages on Revelation 14 that we'll preach from this pulpit. Revelation 14 is divided to three, into three parts. The first five verses of Revelation 14 talk about a group of people called the 144,000. Who are they? What are the characteristics of the 144,000? Are they literal? Is that a figurative number? Are they Jews? Is this something beyond that? What are their characteristics? We're going to study that in one of our sermons, not today. Then from verses 6 to 13, there is a message to prepare people for the coming of Jesus. It's called the three angels message. We'll be studying that from this pulpit, verse by verse. Look at it, how it relates to us. The last six verses from 14 to 20, our study for today on the two harvests, focus on the coming of Christ and the need for positive choices. So in Revelation 14, you have three sections. You have a group on the sea of glass, the redeemed, called the 144,000. You have the message that prepares them to stand on the sea of glass in the three angels' message. Then you have the event for which they are prepared. 
Now, it's very fascinating if you look at Revelation 14, there are six angels mentioned in Revelation 14. The first three angels announce the judgment. The last three angels execute the judgment. Notice this in Revelation chapter 14. So you have in Revelation chapter 14, verse 6, I saw another angel flying in the middle of heaven. That's angel 1. Verse 8, another angel follows saying Babylon is fallen. That's angel 2. Verse 9, then a third angel followed them saying with a loud voice. That's angel number 3. Now look, for example, at verse 15. And another angel came out of the temple. That's angel 4. Verse 17, another angel came out of the temple, a different angel, which is in heaven having the sickle. That's angel 5. Verse 18, another angel came out of the altar. That's angel 6. Between the first three angels that announce the judgment and the last three angels that execute the judgment stands Jesus Christ, the Son of Man. He is the, the peak, the mountain peak of this entire prophecy in the book. So we go now to Revelation chapter 14. And we begin studying today one of the most significant messages in all of Scripture. Revelation 14, verse 14. John is in exile on the island of Patmos. He's an old man. There are deeply etched lines in his face. He has, his hair is gray. His hand is shaking as the heavens are illuminated with the glory of God. And John begins to write, verse 14, I looked and behold a white cloud. John says, I looked away from the trauma of earth. I looked away from the collapsing Roman Empire. I looked away from the ethical and moral values that were crumbling. John says, I looked someplace else. I looked, behold, a white cloud. And on the cloud, one sat like the son of man, having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. Now, Revelation 14, verse 14, is the fulfillment of Acts 1, verse 9 to 11. So we're coming back to verse 14. But notice what it says. John looks up and he sees a white cloud and one on that cloud like the Son of Man. Go back to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Here in the Bible, in Acts chapter 1, the disciples strain their necks to see the last lingering traces of Jesus as he ascends to heaven. And here... As Jesus is ascending, the disciples watch, perplexed, confused, wondering. And here, the scripture says, verse 9, Acts 1, verse 9 to 11. Now when he had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And when they, while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men, that's two angels, of course, stood by them in white apparel, who said, Men of Galilee, why stand you gazing into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you in heaven, that is in the clouds, will so come in like manner as you see him go into heaven. So here, the angels say to the disciples, why are you standing gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus that you saw go up is going to come back. In Revelation chapter 14, the harvest is ripe. Righteousness, the seeds of righteousness that have been sown grow so that the light of the glory of Christ is revealed through his people in the world. But at the same time that the seeds of righteousness are producing a harvest of righteousness, the seeds of evil are producing a harvest of evil. And so in the last days of earth's history, both harvests are fully ripe. The harvest of righteousness and the harvest of wickedness. And in this world before Jesus comes, we will see a manifestation of hate, a manifestation of evil, a manifestation of corruption, a manifestation of wickedness like we've never seen in the history of the universe. It'll be worse than Noah's day and worse than Lot's day. But on the other hand, we will see a manifestation of righteousness in the people of God. 
a love, a purity, an honesty, an integrity, and compassion that has not been witnessed since apostolic times. So both seeds will go to harvest. Back to Revelation, the 14th chapter. Notice what it says. I looked and behold a white cloud. Jesus ascended in the clouds. Jesus will descend in the clouds. He was caught up in the sky. He will return in the sky. Now notice what it says. One like the Son of Man. Now sometimes you read the expression Son of Man and you say that's an expression that describes the humanity of Christ. But it's much more than that. The expression Son of Man was the favorite title that Jesus used of himself. That title is used by Matthew's Gospel 30 times alone. 30 times in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus is called the Son of Man. In fact, in the Gospels, 82 times the Bible talks about Christ as the Son of Man. When you take every one of those references on the Son of Man and study it, something quite remarkable emerges. Take your Bible and turn to Matthew 16, verse 27. There are three thoughts wrapped up in the title, Son of Man, that we read in Scripture. Matthew 16, and you're looking there at verse 27. I want you to see the depth of this title. Matthew 16, verse 27. For the Son of Man will come in glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward everyone each according to his works. Now notice what you see there. Matthew 16, 27. The title Son of Man is linked with Christ coming in glory with his Father, the glory of his Father with his angels, and it's linked with the judgment. So you see these three things. Son of Man the one who walked the dusty streets of Galilee, the one who touched the eyes of the blind and they're open, the touched the ears of the deaf and they're unstopped. This Christ, this Son of Man, is going to return. And when he returns, there'll be a judgment. Every seed is going to harvest. Notice how this is expressed in Matthew chapter 24 as well. Matthew 24, verse 27 and verse 30. Matthew 24, verse 30. 27 and 30. Same idea. Christ comes, Son of Man, judgment. Matthew 24, verse 27 and 28. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, second coming of Christ, so will the coming of what's that next phrase? Son of Man be. For where the carcass is, their eagles will be gathered together. Judgment. So Christ comes, Son of Man. Judgment, return of our Lord. Turn over to Matthew chapter 25, verse 31. When you read the expression, Son of Man, you're read, reading about the glorious return of our Lord Jesus Christ, who comes in heaven, and you're dealing with the concept of judgment. Matthew 25, verse 31 and 32. When the Son of Man comes in his glory... And all the holy angels with him. Again, Son of Man comes. Then he will sit on the throne of his glory. So if you the idea of the Son of Man, you got the idea of the throne. All nations will be gathered before him. He will separate them from one from the other, the sheep from the goats. So in Revelation 14, the Son of Man comes in glory, and you have two harvests, the harvest of golden grain and the harvest of gory grapes. In, Reve in Matthew 25, you have the Son of Man coming again, and you have the sheep and the goats. But the same thing is expressed. Son of Man coming in glory, judgment. Now Daniel's prophecies reveal this same thing. Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7 reveals that great judgment scene. And you're looking there at Daniel 7. We'll begin at verse 9 and 10. Daniel views the seating of the heavenly court with 10,000 times 10,000 angels. The judgment is set. The books are open. In the judgment, the records of our lives are open before the universe. 
the choices that we have made are revealed there. And here, notice what it says. Daniel 7, verse 9 and 10. I watched till the thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, the hair of his head as pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand times thousand ministered unto him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court or the judgment was set. The books were open. So Daniel looks up into heaven and he sees the celestial court of the universe open. He sees 10,000 times 10,000 angels gathering there. It is a majestic scene. The destinies of the entire human race are going to be settled in the judgment. But notice what happens in verse 13 and 14. Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. I was watching in the night visions, and behold... One like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days and they brought him near before him. Here you have Jesus comes. He steps forth in the judgment. And when your name comes up and my name comes up because we've made a decision to accept Jesus Christ, Jesus says, this man, this woman is one of mine. Before the whole universe, Jesus says, my sacrifice is enough the cross is enough. My death is enough. My righteousness is enough. My obedience is enough. My power is enough. My victory is enough. Jesus steps forth. If we have chosen Christ and he lives in our hearts and dwells in our lives, we need not fear the judgment. If the choices that we are making every single day are choices prompted by the Holy Spirit, not shaped and guided by the culture of this world, if we are not simply listening to the inclinations of our own heart to make decisions, but listening to the Holy Spirit, when our names come up in judgment, Jesus steps forward. So back to Revelation chapter 14. What have we discovered in our Bible study so far? We've discovered this. That just as Jesus ascended in a cloud, he will descend in a cloud. That this world is not in the hands of man, it's in the hands of Jesus Christ. The destiny of this world is not in the hands of a few political rulers, whether they're in Washington or Moscow or China or Europe or Asia. This world and its destiny is in the hands of God. We've discovered as well that the expression son of man is an expression that reveals to judgment. It's an expression that reveals to Christ's coming. But notice what it says, on his head a golden crown. Now the Greek word for crown there is Stephanos. And the Stephanos was a victor's crown. When an athlete won an important contest, they were giving the, given the Stephanos, the victor's crown. It was a crown of honor, a crown of glory. It symbolized victory and conquest. Jesus once wore the crown of thorns, symbolizing shame and mockery. He was despised and rejected of men. He was reviled and ridiculed and spit upon and beaten and whipped. But he comes again not wearing the crown of thorns, but wearing the crown of glory. Because evil will not triumph, but righteousness will triumph at last. Jesus comes and he comes again. He comes as King of Kings and he comes as Lord of Lords. Notice verse 14, I looked, behold a white cloud and on the cloud one sat like the Son of Man having on his head the golden crown, not the crown of thorns that pierce his brow so blood comes down his face, but the crown of glory. And in his hand a sharp sickle he comes to reap. Verse 15, another angel comes out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud. Now, wait a minute. Who was the one who sat on the cloud? According to verse 14, who was that? The Son of Man. So the angel comes from the temple. And he says with a loud voice to the one who sits upon the cloud. When we read temple language, who is it that dwells in the most holy place of the temple in the sanctuary above? Who is that? That's God the Father. So the angel comes from the Shekinah glory of God. The angel comes from the presence of God. And the angel says, 
from the presence of God. He cries with a loud voice to him who sits on the throne. That is to Jesus. Thrust in your sickle and reap for the time has come for you to reap. Here the angel comes and is in the temple of God. And God looks at this angel and he says, it's time. The harvest is fully ripe. The angel flies from the temple to Jesus and declares with a loud voice, it's time, Jesus, the harvest is ripe. The harvest of righteousness, the harvest of wickedness, it's ripe. Jesus, go. Jesus, go. Jesus, go. Marshal the forces of heaven. Jesus, go. This is the time. The harvest is ripe. Command the angels, go, Jesus. Get your children and bring them home. The long night of earth is over. Their suffering is over. They've been faithful. Go get my children and bring them home. The only place in the Bible that we find that announcement where the angel comes from the temple of God and speaks to Jesus on the throne is right here in this verse in Revelation. That's where it is. Now notice. Verse 15, another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the throne, thrust in your sickle and reap. For the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Now notice there is another harvest as well. There are two harvests. Notice the second harvest. The first harvest is the harvest of golden grain. The first harvest is the deliverance of the righteous. But notice the second harvest. Then the angel came out of the temple which is in heaven. He also had a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the altar who had power over fire. So this angel who comes has power over fire. In other words, he commands the fiery judgments of God to come upon the wicked so that they will be destroyed. And he cried with a loud cry to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in the sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. Golden grain for the garner of God, fully ripe. The righteous seeds that have been sown down through the ages, the literature given out, the Bible studies that are given, Faithful Adventist Christians who prayed for their neighbors and shared a piece of literature. See, all of that, the harvest of righteousness in the world and in our characters is fully ripe. But also, the harvest of evil is fully ripe. The decisions that have people made to plant the seeds of evil in the world and seeds of evil in their life, that comes fully ripe, verse 19 and 20. So the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. When you read about the wrath of God, that's the judgment of God. And the winepress was trampled outside the city, and blood came out of the winepress up to the horse's bridles for 1,600 furlongs. Now people say, what does that ever mean? 1,600 furlongs, blood up to there to the horse's bridles? A furlong is an eighth of a mile. It's an eighth of a mile. So 1,600 furlongs is 183 miles. From the furthest northest part of Israel to the furthest southern part of Israel is 183 miles. So what this text is saying is this. It, everybody who read this in that day would have understood it. It's saying that every seed has gone to harvest and God is going to wipe out evil because what this text is about is the destruction of evil. He's going to wipe out evil completely. So it's not talking about literal blood flowing from the top of Israel to the bottom. It's talking rather about the total, absolute destruction of evil. And it is a picture because Israel represents the children or the people of God. You and I have accepted Christ, our spiritual Israelites. So what he's saying here is that evil is totally going to be destroyed. Here is an urgent, prophetic message of Revelation 14. Every seed is going to harvest. The grain's fully ripe. The grapes are fully ripe. The people of God reveal his image of grace and compassion and mercy and love before the universe. The children of evil reveal greed and lust and hate and jealousy and purity. 
the character of Christ is revealed in one group and the character of Satan is revealed in another group. Every seed is going to harvest. The universe will see in the people of God a revelation of righteousness that no generation before it has ever seen. The righteousness of Christ will be on display in the people of God. In contrast to that, the universe will see the full results of rebellion against God. Every seed is going to harvest. Wickedness, evil, sin, lawlessness will be on full display. In the last days, the seeds of righteousness and the seeds of wickedness will be fully ripe. Now, every single one of us in the choices we make every day are sowing seed. The, fr the fruit we produce in our life is the result of the seeds that we sow. You cannot sow seeds of evil and reap righteousness. You cannot sow seeds of immorality by what you watch on the TV and reap purity. You cannot sow seeds of dishonesty and reap honesty. You cannot sow seeds of worldliness and reap heavenly mindedness. You cannot sow seeds of anger and reap patience. You cannot sow seeds of intemperance and reap health. You cannot sow seeds of the world's mass media entertainment and reap heaven's character. Now here is a thought-provoking statement. It comes from a book called Great Controversy, page 555, and it says this. The mind gradually adapts itself to the subjects upon which it can dwell. Notice, the mind gradually adapts itself. You don't have a change in your thinking overnight. You don't have a change in your character overnight. But gradually, subtly, imperceptibly, the things that you look at, the things that you allow to go into the senses, are shaping who you are. Subtly, imperceptibly, almost unnoticed at first. Our characters, our personalities change based on the seeds that we're sowing in our minds. Sow good seeds, and you're going to produce good fruit. Sow evil seeds of the world, and you're going to produce the fruit of this world in your character. In every harvest, there are distinct and somewhat certain laws of sowing and reaping. Now, the Bible teaches that in Galatians chapter 6. Revelation talks about the harvest. Paul in Galatians talks about sowing seed. You don't want to miss this one. Galatians chapter 6. Galatians, the sixth chapter. Here we go. Verse 7. Galatians 6 and verse 7. Now, the law of sowing and reaping is, is prevalent in the natural world, and it's also present in the spiritual world. Galatians 6, 7 says this, do not be deceived. Don't be what, everybody? Deceived. I don't want to be deceived, do you? Don't be deceived. Why not? God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. Now, if you're taking notes or underlining in your Bible, underline the word mocked or put a circle around it. The Greek word for mocked is mukter, M-U-K-T-E-R, if I were spelling it in English. And you know what that word means? It comes from the root word nose. Nose. And here's what it means. It means to literally turn up your nose at. It means to treat with contempt or ridicule. In other words, it's saying this. The text is saying this. You can't ignore and treat with contempt God's word, God's truth, God's law, and his eternal heavenly principles without experiencing the consequences in your own life. Notice the next phrase. It says in Galatians 6, 7, don't be deceived. God is not mocked. In other words, you can't turn your nose up at God. You can't ridicule the things of God. You can't leave God's law in contempt. When you know truth and you know what you ought to do, simply to turn your back on that will be to mean to sow seeds of evil in your life and produce a character or a harvest of gory grapes rather than golden grain. Now notice what it says. It says God's not mocked whatever a man sows. Whatever, the Bible says. Now that makes this law of sowing and reaping universal and all-inclusive. It applies to anything we sow. In other words, whatever we sow, if I sow good seed, I'm going to have positive results. If I sow evil seed, 
uh, have a negative results. Everything we sow produces after its kind. And God can't be mocked. You, you can't sow beans and produce watermelons, right? You can't sow beans and produce watermelons. You can't breed cows and produce thoroughbred horses. So no one can sow evil and produce good. You can't sow discord by your gossip and produce unity. Not going to happen. You can't sow lies and produce truth. You can't sow sin and produce holiness. You can't sow unrighteousness and produce righteousness. You can't sow criticism of others and then produce positive relationship with those other people. It's just not positive. You can't sow prayerlessness and produce godliness. Not going to happen. You can't sow a life with lack of Bible study and produce the depth of a spiritual character. If we sow indifference to God in our lifestyle and spiritual values and priorities, we are going to reap the fruit of indifference and apathy, spiritual complacency, and frustration in our spiritual lives. Now, here's something to think about. You ready for this? If you sow a thought, you're going to reap an act. If you sow an act, you're going to reap a habit. If you sow a habit, you're going to reap character. And if you sow a character, you're going to reap your eternal destiny. The promise and warning of Scripture is that we reap what we sow. Now here is the incredible good news. Every day of your life and mine, the Holy Spirit is working in our hearts to lead us to make positive choices. Every day. When we choose to make those positive choices, the Holy Spirit comes to our aid to strengthen us, to enable us to carry out the choice. So the Holy Spirit prompts the choice, the Holy Spirit empowers the choice, but the Holy Spirit doesn't make the choice. Are you with me? The Holy every, every impulse to do right, every desire to do right, is prompted and motivated by the Holy Spirit. But God, through His Spirit, does not make that choice. That choice is ours to make. This means that life's choices are filled with consequences. You cannot make poor choices and avoid the consequences. Now, reaping what we sow, there are seven aspects of this. I'll simply mention them. Number one, we reap only what has been sown. In other words, if you sow the seeds of prayer, you're going to reap spirituality. But if you don't pray, you're not going to reap spirituality. So you reap only what you sow. Number two, we reap in kind as we sow. In other words, think about Daniel. Daniel was thrown into the lion's den. Those who threw him in sowed evil. But what happened to them? They ended up in the lion's den for lunch for those lions. Okay? What about the three Hebrew worthies? They, cast, they were cast into the flames. But what happened to the people that cast them into the flames? They were burned up. So we reap in kind what we sow. Let me speak to you, church. If you sow criticism about others, others are going to criticize you. That's what's going to happen. That's reality. If you sow negative relationships, you're going to have negative relationships. We reap not only what we sow, but we reap in kind what we sow. If you sow kindness, if you sow love, if you sow patience, that's what's going to come back to you. It's the law of cause and effect. Thirdly, you often reap in a different season when you sow. You often reap in a different season. You sow a, a book that you give to somebody and they never respond. But 30 years later, they do, you see. We often reap in a different season than we sow. You sow good seed in your children. And maybe they drift sometime. But later, those seeds come back to bear the fruits of the Spirit in their life. Parents, keep sowing good seed in your children. Keep sowing good seed. Because you may not see that seed all sprout right now. But the incredible good news is... We often don't reap in the same season we sow. You can plant apple trees today and you're not going to get apples tomorrow. It may take three years for those seeds to grow. So, so sow good seed. Fourthly, 
we always reap more than we sow. You don't sow one grain of, grain of corn and get one grain of corn back. You don't see, sow one seed of apple and get one apple back. You always get more than you sow. As you make positive choices, prompted and empowered by the Spirit, you're going to get back so much more than you sow. We reap in proportion to what we sow. The more good you sow, the more good's going to come back. Sixth, unfortunately, we reap what others have sown. We sometimes do. Some guy gets drunk and hits an innocent child, kills them. The child didn't sow that. We reap what others sow. In many nations today, despotic rulers are causing their people to reap what they have sown. Not the people haven't sown it, but the, but the rulers have. We often reap what others have sown. That can be good or bad. This is what that means. The more good seed you sow, the more you're going to bless others by the seed that you sow. So as you sow good seed, you not only are blessing yourself, but you're blessing others. And lastly, it's never too late to begin sowing good seed. You see, there are two fatal mistakes that Christians make regarding this law of sowing and reaping. The first is this. Many Christians spend time grieving over the seeds that they sowed yesterday in previous years. Secondly, they spend time worrying that the seeds they've already sown are going to ruin a future life of joy and fruitfulness in God's cause. There are two days every week that you should never worry about. There are two days every week that you should never worry about. One of those days is yesterday. With its mistakes, its cares, its aches, its pains, its faults and blunders. Yesterday has passed beyond our control. All the money in the world cannot bring it back. We cannot do, undo a single act we performed yesterday. We cannot erase a single word that we said yesterday. Yesterday is gone. The other day that we shouldn't worry about is tomorrow. With its possible adversities, its burdens, its large promise and poor performance. Tomorrow is beyond our immediate control. The sun's going to rise tomorrow and you can't do anything about it. Rain is going to fall or snow will fall tomorrow, hopefully not. The wind will blow. The tides will come in and out. Until we enter tomorrow, we have no stake in tomorrow. It's unborn. We can't influence it. Now that leaves only one day. What day is that? That's today. And any one of us, by the grace of God, can fight the battles of just one day. It's only when you and I had the burdens of those two awful extremities, yesterday and tomorrow, that we fail. Our Heavenly Father is working by His Spirit to prompt you today to make positive choices. The seeds are going to harvest. America's at the crossroads. Society's at the crossroads. Your life is at the crossroads. What seeds will you sow in your life this week. Jesus is wooing us. He's drawing us to himself to make the best positive possible decisions for time and eternity. All the while, the Holy Spirit is empowering us to carry out the desire he's placed in our hearts to make right choices. It's harvest time. The book of Revelation says that soon the harvest will be fully I want to sow seeds of righteousness, sow seeds of goodness, sow seeds of kindness, sow seeds of compassion, sow seeds of love. I want to be part of that group that when the angel says to Jesus, 
go get your children and bring them home for the long night of sin is over. I want to be one of those who look up and say, well, this is our God. We have waited for him and he will save us. As you look back over this week, over this month, have there been choices that you have made that have not sown seeds of righteousness? If you could do this month over again, would you say, Lord, I'd sure make some different choices. Different choices. Would you like to say to Jesus this morning, Jesus, I want to be part of that harvest of golden grain. I really want, Lord, in my life to be guided by your spirit, to make only choices that will honor you, only choices that bring glory to your name, only choices that will reveal your character. Is that your decision this morning? Let's raise your hand if it is and let's pray. You may put your hand down. Is there somebody here this morning as we bow our heads that you know that you need a change in your life? A dramatic change. And this morning you sense that when Jesus comes, there will not be three groups, there will only be two. Those that are all out for Christ and those that are all out against Christ. There'll be no walking on the fence. There'll be no middle ground. That this is not some game-playing religion. But this is a moment of eternal destiny when Christ comes. And the decisions that we make each day determine what side we're on. Is there somebody here this morning that the Spirit of God is speaking to your heart right now? That you feel that tugging in your soul And you want to say, Jesus, right now, I have this moment. I don't have yesterday and I don't have tomorrow, but I have this moment. And I want to surrender my life to you. I want you to forgive me for any of the things, the choices that I've made. And I want to start today by your grace and through your power making positive choices in my life. I need a change, Lord. Come and strengthen me to make that change. Is there somebody like that here today? I Just raise your hand. I want to pray for you. God bless you. God sees these hands. God sees them. Oh, my Father, you see our hands. You know our hearts. And Jesus, thank you that you want to save us more than we want to be saved. Thank you that we can sow seeds of righteousness in the world and see this world as a better place because we've been here. Oh, Lord, Strengthen those who need to make significant changes in their life. Help us make positive choices for time and all eternity. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.